Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to speak in the seminar and thank you for coming, uh, although this is the second talk in a week, so <laughs> yeah, the, the schedule is a little bit unfortunate. Uh, symplectic homology for cobordisms. And uh, the results that I'm going to present and uh, the, uh, the construction is based on joint work uh, with uh, Kai Chilibak and Peter Albers. And uh, so th let me first make things clear, the kind of cobordisms that I want to consider are not any symplectic cobordisms, but Liouville cobordisms. Yeah. So you have a symplectic manifold with boundary, but uh, this symplectic manifold comes with a primitive of the symplectic form. And uh, when you restrict, uh, if the manifold is dimension to n, when you restrict this on the boundary, uh, right, on each connected component, it either coincides or not with uh, its a volume form, and it coincides or not with uh, the orientation uh, as boundary mm, of W. And if it coincides, this exhibits the positive part of the boundary. And if it does not co uh, coincide, this uh, singles out, singles out uh, the negative part of the boundary. Yeah. And alternatively, as you very well know, you can define yeah. these in a little bit more geometric manner by saying that you have a vector field which uh, is dual to the primitive, and this vector field points outwards uh, along the positive boundary and inwards along the negative boundary. So the goal of the talk today is to advertise for some problems related to cobordisms and then for a specific tool that allows us to give some very, very partial answer to such problems. Okay. So examples, of course, uh, there is an important example, and that is the trivial cobordism over a contact manifold. Hmm? Yeah. You take interval times m. Yeah. And you put there as a symplectic form, say, uh, d of uh, r alpha output, where the interval is somewhere contained in uh, zero infinity. Yeah. And that's. Then, of course, there are important cobordisms, which are those that have no uh, negative boundary. Right? If the boundary, negative boundary is empty, right? we speak of Liouville domains. Liouville domains. Right? Now, there is important cobordisms coming up from handle attachment. Right? Whenever we have, say, some cobordism here, right? And then we look at the positive boundary, negative boundary. And then inside the positive boundary, as soon as you single out an isotropic sphere, k minus 1, k at most n, isotropic with trivialization of the conformal symplectic normal bundle, you can add a handle here, and this provides a cobordism. Yeah. 
So add handle, handle attaching provides attaching or Weinstein handle attaching uh, provides uh, symplectic cobordism and as a matter of fact what we call Weinstein cobordism. Yeah? cobordism. And the Weinstein domain is one that can be presented in such a way and uh, Weinstein cobordism is one that can be presented by starting with the negative boundary and then successively attaching such, uh, such handles. Then here's another uh, interesting situation in which you, you get uh, Weinstein cobordisms. So assume you have an isolated singularity, right? x1, xn. Let's say you have, uh, well, let's put x0 here. So with isolated singularity at 0, at 0, and uh, you, uh, you, you consider the intersection of a small sphere, 2n plus 1, of radius epsilon, radius epsilon, small, small, right? And you intersect it with the 0 set, right? So you have here the singularity, you intersect with a small sphere. The intersection is going to be transverse because the singularity is isolated for epsilon small. And uh, you see here at the intersection a contact manifold. Yeah, that's uh, some contact manifold. Standard. This comes from the complex tangencies. So that's contact manifold, and actually it is uh, Weinstein fillable because this is part of the, this is called the link of the singularity, link of singularity, of the singularity. And as soon as you look at uh, a closed fiber here, right, the boundary is going to be contact diffeomorphic, actually contact isotopic to the previous one, but the fiber is going to be smooth, right? So this is uh, Weinstein fillable. Weinstein filling provided by the so-called Milnor fiber, yeah? So now perform the following operation, perturb a little bit F, right? One such perturbation could be Morsify, right? You have a complicated singularity, you perturb it in a generic, generic way, and you morsify it. You split it in a certain number, which is the Milner number of non degenerate singularity, right? So let G be small perturbation. Yeah? Small perturbation of, uh, uh, of F. And then what you see is inside, inside this, so this was the original, the original uh, singularity. Maybe it splits into several ones, right? And now you are allowed to intersect you are allowed to consider the the intersection of uh, small ball with the germ of the singularity at each of the critical points that has been created here right Right? Maybe you have several components arriving there, but whatever it takes, here you have created, as a matter of fact, since everything, everything happens uh, in a neighborhood of this, uh, of this thing, far away nothing will happen to the fiber, right? 
nothing will happen to the fiber. It's only near the singularity the, situ the, the situation gets, gets moved along. And what you end up seeing is a cobordism between the link of the singularity of G and the link of the singularity of F. See cobordism, Weinstein cobordism between the link of G, which appears now at the negative boundary, and the link of F, which appears now at the positive boundary. Yeah. Now, we have to imagine that when we perturb a singularity, it becomes, it splits into simpler singularities. Yeah? And it's not by accident that the link of the simpler singularities appear at the negative end, because morally, what we wish to, uh, the, uh, the intuition, which is also going to guide the results that I'm going to write, is that in a cobordism, something, and this something, I do not know exactly what it is, gets more complicated. Complicated from the negative boundary to the positive boundary. So what we, the kind of questions that one wants to address are given two contact given two contact manifolds contact manifolds uh, are they cobordant are they cobordant and in which direction direction meaning which one can be underneath which one can be uh, above uh, Given two singularities, singularities, uh, are they adjacent? Meaning, is one perturbation of the other? One is perturbation of the other. Right? And, uh, this is also related to the question of, uh, say, given Liouville domain, two Liouville domains, can we embed one into the other? One into the other. If we can embed one into the other, we see immediately appearing a uh, cobordism between the boundary of the one that we embed and the, the bigger boundary. So, all these questions are related with each other. Yeah. So here are some results. Here are some results. The first one is uh, some results. So maybe uh, theorem one. which is due to Casals, Murphy, Pressas, yeah. is that in dimension uh, at least five, cobordisms such that the negative boundary is overtwisted are not symplectically obstructed. Or are unobstructed. And right, are symplectically unobstructed. So what does this mean? 
we have a definition of, uh, of overtwistedness in higher dimensions uh, due to Murphy, Bormann, and Eliasberg, which I will not recall now. But the meaning of this, of this theorem is the following. If you have uh, two contact manifolds, some, say uh, M minus with uh, contact structure that's overtwisted, and M plus with some contact structure, and uh, Smooth cobordism, W, which satisfies all the conditions that you want so that it has a chance of being Weinstein cobordism, huh? uh, such that uh, the pair uh, retracts onto uh, a relative CW complex of half dimension, CW complex of uh, dimension at most n, where these are of dimension to n minus 1, and uh, plus existence of some almost complex structure right? that is compatible with. Uh, the contact structures at boundary. Yeah? And the almost complex structure needs to be on W. Then there exists Weinstein structure on this same manifold such that it realizes a cobordism between these two. Yeah? So you have two manifolds. Uh, they admit contact structures, and one of them has overtwisted and you have only this compatibility, mild compatibility condition, then this is symplectic cobordism. So this is saying to you that uh, in a certain sense overtwisted manifolds, contact manifolds are the simplest ones, right? And uh, since they are so simple, there is no obstruction whatsoever into building any kind of cobordism to anything else. Right? Philosophy. Second theorem. Yeah. So let's see uh, how this goes the other there in the other direction. Maybe I will attribute this to Nieder Kruger. Say that again. If the topological things are satisfied, right? Yes. So, f for example, you pick <laughs> you pick uh, you pick a given one smooth manifold of dimension of odd dimension, right? And uh, pick one contact structure that over that's over twisted, another one that's not over twisted, right? And look at the trivial cobordism. Then you can make that into a Weinstein cobordism. OK, so uh, theorem 2, which I will attribute to Niederkruger, but it also relies on, on uh, equivalent characterizations of Casals, uh, Murphy, Pressas of what overtwisted means, is that there is no symplectic cobordism OK, so let me write. I'll write Liu Vilko Buddhism. And then I will uh, make a remark. W, such that the negative boundary is uh, hypertight, and the positive boundary is uh, overtwisted. Yeah? So hypertight means that there exists a contact form uh, with no closed contractible rib orbits. Okay. 
when I say that there is no such cobordism, in particular, <laughs> it encompasses uh, the result of Helmut with uh, maybe in higher dimensions with Peter Albers, that overtwisted contact manifolds always satisfy the Weinstein conjecture. Right? Whenever you are looking, you are considering the question, is there a cobordism such that the negative boundary is hypertight? Yeah? and the positive boundary is something else, right? Uh, and you obstruct such, then it means that in particular you have proved with the statement, the, uh, the Weinstein conjecture for the contact manifold on top, right? Because if it did not satisfy the Weinstein conjecture, then you would take the trivial cobordism, okay? <laughs> so, uh, okay, uh, how does this go? The, actually, it comes from the feeling by holomorphic disk technique and the fact that overtwisted manifolds carry a, a, carry a plastic stufe in the sense of Niederkruger. And Niederkruger has proved that overtwisted contact manifolds are not fillable by looking at some family of bishop disks and arguing th that if they were fillable, you would have some, you would have compactness, right? And the only component of the boundary will be represented by the plastic stufe. And uh, now you can run exactly the same argument, but in a cobordism by completing the negative end by the negative part of the symplectization, and you know that you still have compactness because there can be no bubbling off of holomorphic planes there because you don't have such a periodic orbit, right? So uh, this is why I, I attribute this to Niederkruger, although it kind of turns around several ideas. So theorem three, uh, which is uh, the one that I, I will take as a motivation to speak about symplectic homology for cobordisms, is uh, this result that we are able to prove with uh, Peter and Kai, namely that uh, there is no uh, Liouville cobordism W such that the negative boundary is hypertight and uh, the positive boundary say is uh, Stein subcritically fillable. And more generally, more generally, and this more generally I'm, I'm going to explain when I speak a little bit more about what the definition of symplectic homology is, uh, symplectic homology of the positive boundary is uh, well defined and vanishes. important such that first turn class is zero. I mean, I somehow think that the same should be true without this assumption, but we're, I'm not able to prove it without this assumption. Yeah? Uh, very good. So this is the, the result that I, will, uh, that I will prove. Now, <coughs> what about examples of hypertite manifolds? So there are many examples of hypertite which are fillable for example 
take take uh, unit cotangent bundles of uh, closed manifolds which admit uh, Riemannian matrix uh, with uh, non-positive uh, sectional curvature. But of course, if it were only for examples that are fillable, uh, such a result could uh, be proved very easily using just symplectic homology. Right? Because if symplectic homology, for example, if the manifold is subcritically Stein fillable, you look at uh, Morally, uh, you look at a cobordism like this, right? D plus, D minus, and if ever the negative boundary is fillable, right? You can think symplectic homology of the big object is uh, zero, right? But uh, because you have a transfer map that is a unital ring homomorphism, this implies that the symplectic homology of uh, this thing is zero as well which is certainly not true in that situation. Yes. I missed something. What yes. do you mean? Uh, how, I mean, so let's say you have the positive boundary. I mean, how do you know that it's in the boundary of infinity? I would have thought that all you could say that this X plus of the positive boundary is isomorphic to the cohomology of the subcritical scaling. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Uh, so I want to say exactly what this means. Yeah, and this will also answer your or answer your question in a in a minute. I I say if ever it's independent, uh, well, if ever it it is independent of the filling up to something very little, okay. The positive part is independent of the filling, so you only have maybe things that lie in finitely many degrees. Yeah, and, and so it doesn't cover the normal. Problem. Yes, it has no room for other generations. Yes. So you, you can turn such a picture into a, into a rigorous argument. OK? I, and I just want to say that if the negative boundary would be fillable, you could definitely approach the question with just symplectic homology. You would not need another version of symplectic homology. OK? But there are non-fillable examples. Yeah? There are non-fillable examples. And uh, these are essentially due, uh, actually, in, in all dimensions. In dimension 3, uh, famously, uh, T3 with some uh, sequence of contact structures, which is uh, oh. Which is, <laughs> yeah, cosinus k s d theta plus sinus k s d t, right? For k bigger or equal than one, right? This is non-fillable if uh, k is at least two, and this was proved by uh, Eddie Ashberg twenty years ago. But you have such examples in all dimensions due to Masso, Niederkrieger, and Wendel. You have variations. T2 cross some manifolds. Similarly, Psi K, Masso. the Kruger event. Yeah. So these are examples that interpret in a very creative way the fact that uh, T3 is T2 cross S1. Yeah? And the fact that on S1 you have two very special contact forms, which is D theta and minus D theta. 
Yeah? And uh, Masoni, the Kruger, and Wendel are able to construct contact manifolds, which admi admit very special pairs of contact forms, so that when you combine them together in a similar manner, you get something that's non-fillable for uh, k at least 2. So there are examples. And those are not, uh, are not, uh, do not fall under the scope of uh, symplectic homology. Very good. So I want to uh, speak now about uh, symplectic homology for a cobordism. Yeah. So I will denote it SHW. W is my favorite cobordism. And the assumptions that one needs to impose are either that the negative boundary is hypertite, yeah, or that it is fillable, or say the first churn class is zero for the cobordism and all uh, closed rep orbits uh, on the negative boundary yeah, have Conlisander index plus n minus 3 bigger than 1. Yeah. And in this situation, we can define a group. And the group is defined by a count uh, of closed rep orbits on the positive boundary, positively parametrized. And with starting point, not modulo parametrization, then critical points of some Morse function on W and closed rev orbits on the negative boundary negatively parametrized. And again, with starting point. So this is the intuition. Now, for the exact way to implement this, one draws some Hamiltonians. Hamiltonians, which have the following shape. Yeah. You have here the cobordism. Yeah. And you complete it, say, with the positive part of the symplectization, negative part of the symplectization here. And you consider Hamiltonian of this shape. let's say, which uh, have some slopes, tau and nu, here. 
the Hamiltonian that I have drawn is this one. The slopes must not be uh, periods of some closed rib orbits on either of the boundary, which makes that you do not have period one orbits, closed orbits of the Hamiltonian vector field here in the regions where it is linear. But that leaves uh, a lot of choices if it, that by taking different sequence, different series. Different? Series. Well, I have a, I'm not done. Uh, so okay. I'm not done. I'm not done. This is the kind of Hamiltonian that we, yeah? And I want to say that for this type of Hamiltonian, we've got, we have to think of it if we want to compute some Fleur homology group as being perturbed a little bit in the regions, yeah? And the group that I want to define is, starts from some Fleur homology group of such Hamiltonian, truncated in some given action window. Mm -hmm. And there are some limits. So first of all, we're going to take to let the slopes go to infinity. Yeah. So this is a direct limit. The Hamiltonian goes up. Yeah. Then we take an inverse limit over the negative bound on the action and the direct limit over the positive bound. So now there's no slopes anymore involved, and that's it. That's the thing. Okay. Now, the fact that we work in a given action window, which is finite, so these parameters, A and B, are chosen not to be equal to plus or minus infinity, makes that when we increase the slopes, here, we actually get rid of generators that appear in this region, right? which for some normalization of the symplectic action fall outside the, the action window. And so what we're left with are generators that live in this area, in this area, yeah, and in this area. Okay. And of course, as Helmut says, we don't want to, to, we want to take everything into account. If we want to have something that's invariant, say, up to deformation of the Liouville structure, we absolutely need to not truncate. Yeah? So we let the, the bounds of the action interval go to infinity. Yeah? So this is very good. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Absolutely, it matters. It absolutely matters for A and B. Yes, yes, it matters in a very, in a very important way. And uh, so, I will, I will. Uh, maybe the before saying, giving an explanation of how it's going to matter. Uh, let me just point out that we have some flavors of this. Uh, yeah. So there's a these guys, the orbits that appear on the positive boundary have positive action. The orbits that appear on the negative boundary, as we set up the problem, have negative action. And these have zero action. So zero is definitely some important parameter here. Yeah? So we have flavors which correspond to truncating at 0 or not. Yeah? So for example, what I will call negative equals 0 corresponds to letting b equals to 0, or something b equal epsilon. Yeah? So we take into account only these things. Yeah? Now we have smaller than 0, which corresponds taking b equal to minus epsilon and just leave it there. Yeah. Uh, we have sh uh, bigger or equal than 0. 
that means take a equals minus epsilon bigger than zero, which is a equals epsilon, right? This, by the way, now looks a lot and is the positive part of symplectic homology. Right? And the very important equal to zero, yeah? which corresponds to a and b being uh, very close to zero and not taking any kind of limit. And this one, with the conventions that I use, although I call the object homology, and this is the, uh, so this is cohomology of the cobordism. Okay, singular cohomology of the cobordism. Right. So now, what about these limits? We want an object that carries a product, and ideally be a ring with unit. And this is indeed the case, right? So this is ring with unit, with unit. And the way the product goes is the following. Imagine we have, so of course the product is going to be defined by pair of pants, right? If I look at the product, say, for a given Hamiltonian, yeah. Uh, the pair of pants is going to at most add the actions, so I will land in minus infinity to b, right, of twice the Hamiltonian, say, right. So now I will also write this redundantly. Uh, I will write the same thing with A. Yeah. It goes to C minus infinity to A. Maybe I'll write a B here. And I'll write an A plus B of 2H. And as a consequence, you have a product that's defined on the truncated complex and which sends you to a plus b to b. So this truncated complex really has to be understood as a quotient complex. Yeah? So if you want to understand where you land, you want to know if ever you have something that has action less than a and something that has action less than b, where does it go? And it goes here. Right? So that's the way it works. And now, if ever I would have taken uh, in, if ever I had taken <laughs> uh, first a direct limit over B, I would, you see that in here, with a direct limit over B going to infinity, I just don't see anything anymore. I just go very far to infinity, right? This, this becomes negligible action window that escapes to infinity. But if I take first an inverse limit as A goes to minus infinity, automatically I find myself in a very good position because uh, I, uh, maybe now I should write some uh, symplectic homology group, which is the inverse limit, yeah, which goes to symplectic homology minus infinity to b, okay? So this is an inverse limit over a going to minus infinity. And now as you let b go to infinity, you find the requested product on that group. And if you would have to, uh, if one, uh, if we had taken the limits in the, other, in the other order, we would have not gotten something meaningful. Okay. So this is, Im this is interesting because it, One, one source of inspiration, comment. Uh, so one source of inspiration for this definition is the fact that if we take M to be, say, contact manifold, contact manifold, yeah. 
let's say for simplicity that it is fillable. Yeah. With filling F. Yeah. Then uh, Chilibach and Fraunfelder had defined uh, Rabinovitz Fleur homology of M inside F. Yeah? Now, you can think now of uh, using the notation symplectic homology of M. Secretly, there's the F lurking in over there. To be the symplectic homology of the trivial cobordism. Yeah? Inside trivial cobordism, inside, uh, inside F. Right, we have the filling, and in here we have a little cobuddhism, which is this. And now what we had proved with uh, Kai and Urs is that Rabinovitz Fleur homology of this boundary is isomorphic to symplectic homology. So in this situation, uh, you, what you would see would be like the filling, which is here, the boundary, which is here. And then you see a Hamiltonian that does this, and then uh, wants to continue in some way inside the filling. And at least at the level of generators, you see exactly the objects that are captured by, by uh, Rabinovitz Fleur homology. Yeah? Except that, uh, despite some efforts, it seems very hard, if not impossible, to construct a product in Rabinovitz Fleur homology. Yeah? But this construction gives you the product for free. So that was definitely one, one uh, uh, motivation and uh, intuition that we had in order to consider So there should be also a completely pseudo-homorphic SFT yes. Say. Yes. Where just that you go up there just means that you only look at certain. Yes. Certain yes. Yes. Okay. Which would uh, indeed it would be parallel to the translation from symplectic homology to some non-equivariant version of contact homology. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Which is not written down, but definitely one can one can uh, perform such such a thing. So. Now I, uh, I think I'm ready for, for the proof. For the proof. Yeah. Where should I? Maybe I will erase this one. It turns out that these, these groups, and I will not speak too much about it, uh, fit into a what I find lovely structure in which you can define relative homology groups. You have pair of sub pair of cobordism with sub cobordism stacked in, and then you can define some relative groups in there. And uh, the important piece of structure is that the long exact sequence of a pair holds. Yeah. But for what I will need today is that we have transfer maps. Yeah. So if you have a cobordism which is uh, stacked from three pieces, yeah. Say uh, I'll write uh, top and then V and bottom, yeah. then you have a transfer map. Yeah. The terrible transfer map, which is a map of rings with units. So 
So this is uh, the map that I will that I will construct. And now, if one thinks about the question of uh, prohibiting some cobodisms between contact manifolds, at first sight, the situation is a little bit uh, not so good. Because you have transfer maps from a cobodism to the symplectic homologies of the positive boundary and of the negative boundary. Yeah? But there is no way in which these two things are related directly by a map. Right? So actually, the cobodism acts a little bit like a correspondence between the groups that you associate to the other boundaries. This is exactly like the way cohomology acts, right? cohomology behaves. So how from information on this and from info information on that can you infer, uh, can you reach a contradiction taking into account that you do not have a way to go directly from one into the other? And that's how usually arguments in symplectic homology work. Like you, you say you map the unit to the unit, and then if something vanishes on the big thing, something vanishes in the small thing. But the situation is, is the si this apparent uh, uh, discouraging symmetry is broken if you take into account the various flavors of symplectic homology, truncated with zero. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I will write is uh, a longish diagram, which is uh, starting with uh, the symplectic homology for the cobordism, and then symplectic homology bigger equals 0 for the cobordism, and then strictly bigger than 0. Hmm? So this is tautological exact sequence coming from truncation by the action. Yeah? And everything is functorial. and. Uh, we went to a little bit of pain with Kai in order to prove functoriality in all sorts of disguises. So uh, here we have uh, the same thing, the same sequence, but written now for the positive part of the boundary. Okay. And we've, we've got maps here. And I will write at least uh, two maps here. SH and 0, negative. And uh, OK. So we have maps as such. Now what can we say? Because of the way the theory is constructed, if I look at the positive boundary and at the part of homology that's truncated in positive action, right? I see that these maps are isomorphisms. Right? Because I'm counting positively parametrized orbits on the positive boundary. Were it for this Hamiltonian, for the whole cobordism, or for this Hamiltonian, which would be the Hamiltonian corresponding to, to the positive boundary. So those maps are, are isomorphisms. And now I wish to look at the unit here, yeah, which is sent to the unit. That's just the map in cohomology. right? That's H0 of uh, W, and that's H0 of the positive boundary. OK? And now, if symplectic homology, if symplectic homology of the positive boundary vanishes, then 
the map going from zero to uh, to uh, bigger or equal zero sends one to zero. Why is that? It's because if this vanishes, it means that the unit is killed by something coming from the positive boundary. Okay. Now the the unit is a count of is described as a count of holomorphic planes, which are asymptotic to to some uh, Reb orbits. It could be that the unit the unit has is necessarily represented in this area, action less than or equal to zero, and in the region where it is uh, the part of the unit that's represented by action exactly equal to zero is the unit for cohomology. So if the whole thing is killed by something com coming from the positive direction, it means that this thing is in particular killed as well. Right? So this is sent to zero. So that unit is sent to one. This one is sent to zero here by assumption. It means it comes from something here. Let's call it x. Right? But this is an isomorphism. So it has some. Uh, lift, which is unique. And this lift maps into something, let's say a y, which goes to 1. And this is the, the point where I use the fact that the first chain class is 0. I need to be able to work in grading equal to n, because in that grading, this map is injective. Maybe the positive boundary has several components, but whatever it takes, the map from H0 to H0 is injective. So uh, this y is equal to the 1, to the unit, and that means that 1 is sent to 0 here. Yeah? But uh, 1 is sent to 0 there. This one it also goes to it also goes there, and by go commutativity of the diagram, this is sent to zero. And what's the geometric meaning? It means that some critical point has been killed <laughs> by something coming from positive action, but the class that kills it necessarily involves a closed orbit, closed contractible orbit. And this is uh, the contradiction with the assumption that the negative boundary was hypertight. Right? That's the end of the proof and the end of the talk.